without further ado, I will pass over to Caroline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for that really lovely introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, it looks like you've had a fantastic couple of days, so it's a real pleasure to be here. First up, I just want to thank all of the organisers, particularly Sarah French and Caitlin Dooley and the rest of the fantastic DECR board for the Association for Art History. I think it's so important that they continue to strive for and to create a more diverse, inclusive future for the study of art history in its broadest sense. So it's lovely to be a part, a small part of this. And a special thanks also to the Association for Art History team, especially Claire Davis. Uh, it means a huge amount to me to have been asked by the DECR to give the closing keynote today, not um, just because I still see myself as relatively very early, early in my career. So in one sense, I think, what do I really have to offer and how useful is my advice? Uh, but also, and perhaps more importantly, because as Sarah mentioned, I was previously the chair of the DECR board. Um, and it's been amazing to see the board continue to grow. And even during current situations, the fact that there's so many participants tuning in uh, online is really fantastic. So hopefully in this 30 minute keynote, I can kind of give an insight into who I am, what I do um, and how I got here. So I'm an art historian and a museum curator and my research interests really span the 17th to the 19th centuries, particularly interested in European decorative arts and design, material culture, the histories of collecting, the histories of museums and the intersection between sculpture and ceramics. So quite a varied amount of things. I'm not your typical art historian in the sense of I'm not really dealing with 2D objects. I'm much more about the um, stuff you can actually get your hands on as it were. Over the last six to seven years, I've really tried to and have been determined to make sure that I can work across both museums and universities within academia. So hopefully today I can try and give you an insight into what that means and how I've tried to navigate the art world since my undergraduate days by trying to kind of carve out a space for myself and also um, carve out my own network. I've been incredibly lucky in lots of ways um, I've worked incredibly hard and I just really want to be honest about some of the challenges uh, that there are and the realities that um, the toll that precarity can take on you, especially if you're working three to four jobs for short term temporary contracts, unsure when they will be renewed um, and how that all really works in reality. So hopefully I can kind of demonstrate um, my experiences, as it were. Overall, I think one of the first things to really stress is how important I think it is that we don't necessarily just pigeonhole ourselves within the kind of art, the career of the art world or within careers of the arts world, but that we're able to collaborate and to learn and to work across a range of sectors from universities to museums, to the art market, to working directly with artists and to responding with them and to our audiences and so on. Uh, and I think, that idea of collaboration has probably been coming through a lot in the last couple of days and is probably even more important today than it's ever been before. So at the moment I'm teaching a course on the history of museums and for the first lecture I asked my students to think about what a museum means to them and how they feel when they enter into that kind of space. And for me, my own answers to that question have kind of shaped how I really wanted to put this keynote talk together um, and have been quite useful for helping me think about my own journey. So I'm originally from Ireland. I grew up in quite rural uh, County Fermanagh, which is right in the north, um, close to the border. And there weren't really any art galleries or museums around, although we did have a ceramics factory quite close, which probably suggests why I love ceramics so much. Um, but growing up, I didn't really know that there was such a thing as art history. And when I first learned about it, I definitely didn't think initially it was for me. Uh, and I think it's important to talk about these things. I remember my first kind of real visit um, to uh, Museum National Gallery in London actually and um, I have such a vivid memory of being 11-12 and absolutely overwhelmed by Van Gogh's 
uh, yellow flowers uh, flower painting, the sunflowers. I'm sure some of you will know what I maybe mean by that one. Um, and it it kind of overwhelmed me so much. Um, and, but I also at the same time was thinking, oh, well, I could never work in an imposing building like this or with art like that. You know, who does this um, and how do you get here? Anyways, I basically was kind of gone from that moment um, and I spent all of my pocket money in the gift shop. We're getting very nostalgic here, but I spent all my money in the gift shop and I bought a Van Gogh sunflower jigsaw with all my money, which I still have today, which I think maybe, maybe says a lot. Um, and a couple of years later, I became really uh, just more and more interested about what history of art or art history actually meant. Um, but I thought really it was elitist. It was for people who spoke in a certain way, uh, were from a certain kind of class background, whose families maybe owned art, had these types of pictures on their walls. And I was really aware that that wasn't me. Um, but growing up where I did, I sort of started to see art history and visual culture in a very different way even for a kind of teenager, um, growing up at the end of the Troubles and seeing the way that things looked around me in Northern Ireland um, and how it was related to art and to its histories. Um, so things like the different color of school uniforms, which in Northern Ireland signals which side you're from, what your religion is. Um, the fact that murals appeared um, across a range of towns and cities and villages or the fact that there were lots of new pieces of architecture being commissioned and built in the early 2000s that were replacing bomb sites or places of ruin. So it's amazing for me when I think back, actually, as a teenager, being some, some becoming conscious of these things and what that actually means. Um, and realizing that art history has a role to play in what we see around us, uh, which hit me, I think, quite early on and hasn't really kind of stopped since. So I uh, headed off to actually study art history for my undergraduate degree, along with French at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, it was kind of uh, not a risk, I don't think, but it was definitely um, something to explain that this is what I had chosen to do at university. Um, and when I arrived and started studying it there, I was inevitably met with some of the stereotypes of this field, people whose families were big art collectors who ran Christie's, who lived in country houses. And I, in particular, one thing that struck me is I met very few students who also had to do part-time jobs just to survive. But um, what I also met with and saw, particularly in the art history department, were a huge range of people, especially my professors who absolutely loved my subject. Um, and were passionate or just as passionate about this subject as I was. So I guess what I'm kind of getting towards here is it's really important that we pursue what interests us, but also don't ever think that you won't fit in or that art history or the art history world isn't for you. And I realize I'm speaking in many ways as a, from a, quite a real position of privilege as a white woman, as a curator working in a national museum. But I think it's so important that we collaborate and work together to break down the assumptions and barriers which are completely ingrained and embedded within the art world to really try to start to diversify the workforce and the people who feel like we who can soon feel like they do belong or should feel that they belong. Although I think there are lots of realities around that, pay for one being a huge sort of barrier, um, something I'm going to come back to in a bit. But I think it's important to think about more critically how we belong in these spaces or if we belong in these spaces. Um, last year, I ran a few modules for art market students at the University of Leeds. And one of the days we traveled to London to visit dealers and auction houses. And I remember we all had a conversation before we went in to talk about how we felt entering these spaces. Um, and I think more to the point that many of the students present didn't realize that anyone could just go into these spaces. Uh, and actually that's something that's really key, art auction houses. Um, you can go in, you can go to viewing days, you don't need to be invited. And it's a place where you can actually really see and learn quite a lot about art for free. Um, so I think it's important to mention that. Um, I don't necessarily feel that I still belong, or yet still feel that I belong in the art world, but I think it's definitely getting better. Um, and I think that, um, will only continue hopefully to get better as long as we kind of work together to do so. But 
you do, especially as a younger woman, you do get the patronizing comments, the people who decide not to address me with my doctor title, even though they can see it. Um, or quite often I get pulled up on how I pronounce certain names, particularly English names, for example, um, because I've only ever seen them written down or it's my accent. Uh, and I think we have to kind of strive together to go against that. Something that really struck me in my memory when I was thinking about this talk is a few years ago, I gave a lecture in Manchester at a conference. It was a really big conference. Um, I was really pleased with my lecture. Um, it was all coming from my PhD. It was quite new research. So I was really delighted afterwards. And I was in the bathrooms, washing my hands, kind of, you know, not really minding my business. And a woman came up to me and I thought, oh gosh, she's going to say well done. And she handed me a list of all the names that I pronounced incorrectly of uh, different English families. Um, and I think when things like that happen, and I think it's important to talk about the fact that they do happen, how do we react? Um, how do we change that? And for me, it just makes me more resolved to make change how the art world looks and, and at least certain aspects of that art world. And I think we have to work together to achieve that. So how did I get to where I am today? I don't want this to just be a trip down memory lane, but quite kind of briefly, I do want to whiz you through how I got here in my journey. And I know lots of other journeys will be very, very different. I know even in the last 10, 11 years since I started my undergrad studies that things have really, really changed. Um, but I guess one of the key things, of course, is experience. And in many ways, I really hate this word because so often you have to be experienced to even qualify to get some experience. And I'm sure that's something that's been coming up over the last couple of days. And of course, there's a lot of exploitation that happens with that, with volunteering or people taking unpaid internships. I, I couldn't afford to take anything that was not paid or any kind of experience for internship that was not paid. So based on that, I ended up taking a slightly different route during my undergrad. I spent my weekends and my summers working in administration for theatre, theatre companies, producing plays, managing theatre shows. And essentially that gave me an end to the art world in terms of creative arts more broadly, but it also gave me a huge range of transferable skills. Um, so I think it's important to know that it's okay to get experience outside of the sector and transfer those skills over if and when you can. I was really quite lucky in my third year at university because someone told me this gem of fact that I could go and visit an auction house for free. And it sounds crazy, but that advice absolutely changed everything for me. Um, and I spent a lot of my time getting the bus down to Edinburgh, if anyone, any of you know Scotland very well, and going to Lyon and Turnbull Auction House, which is a really lovely auction house, um, the oldest in Scotland. And I went to look at auctions at anything from books to paintings to antiques to sculpture and I spoke to the specialists and the sales room staff and at that point I realized that they had a paired internship program which I didn't know about before then. I applied for that and was very lucky to get accepted onto that so the month before my final year at St Andrews I worked as an intern in their decorative arts and antiques department and that is really why I'm here where I am today because from that point onwards I kind of had the deck arts bug and I wanted to know absolutely everything about ceramics and furniture and silver and sculpture and really get to know the objects and so I kind of sought a master's program that was the right one for me in order to specialize in this area. So I applied for and ended up doing my master's in decorative arts with the Wallace Collection Museum and University of Buckingham. It was in London, which was quite daunting to me at that time. And I um, ended up doing the master's full time, luckily on a scholarship, but because it was London and we all know what that means, it's an expensive place to live. I also needed to work two to three days as well alongside that. So I think it's important that we recognize how difficult that can sometimes be and necessary for quite a lot of students, especially today, I think. So choosing the master's programme that was best for me was really kind of key. Um, I, one of the main reasons I picked it was that it had an inbuilt research placement within it. So if you're just finishing your undergrad and you're looking around for master's, it's really important to think about what opportunities 
um, do they offer that might you know help you when you get out the other side? So my research placement during the masters was again um, kind of uh, led me in one particular direction. I worked at for Strawberry Hill, uh, which is um, the home of Horace Walpole, and I did provenance research on his art collection. Um, many of his and trace pieces that had ended up in the art market. And essentially this experience is the main reason that I ended up getting my first job out of the masters. I was hired as an assistant curator for a private art collection, the Chicha Collection in London. Um, and that was solely on the fact that they needed an AC, an assistant curator who could do provenance research. So I'd love to think it was my sparkling personality and my knowledge of decorative arts and maybe that helped a bit, but it was that one um, thing, that one bit of the job description that I actually had experience in that suddenly kind of put me in line to get that job. So I think it's important to know that sometimes, sadly, it is just about being lucky or maybe more to the point, it's about being in the right place at the right time. For any of you who've worked with or come across private art collections, they can be wonderful places to work. Um, they're normally smaller organisations. You end up doing a huge amount in your day-to-day -day job, but they can be quite intense. So I worked there for just under two years. I was eventually promoted to curator. And during that time, I um, did a huge amount. I wrote two coffee table books. I collected objects for the collection and acquired new things. I didn't have a very good work-life balance, which is something I, ref when I reflect upon that, something I really regret. Um, but I did kind of develop professionally. I also curated an international exhibition um, on tea art and history at the National Museum of Kazakhstan in Astana, which is probably the most random thing I will ever do in my career. Um, but I think what you do get from working in a smaller organization and it's really important and uh, I talk to my students a lot about this because I think so often when we think of museums we think of these glittering large institutions and nationals and actually you can learn so much um, from and um, perhaps even more from a smaller organization where you can do a variety of different tasks perhaps more than you traditionally would do in that role say in a more national museum. So for me, this was really an invaluable experience, uh, but I honestly really missed kind of the in-depth research um, and was really trying to figure out where I wanted to place myself in the world and decided to leave the job to pursue a PhD, which was a bit of a risk at that time. Um, but I waited kind of until the moment was right. I had a very good and right supervisor for me and I had a really solid PhD proposal which I think is really key for those of you um, taking thinking about taking those next steps um, and I was really lucky to um, after several applications and working on various grants to receive a HRC which is Arts Humanities um, Research Council funding for the PhD. So I took up a fully funded PhD at the University of Leeds in 2015 and I really emerged my, immersed myself in the PhD. Um, I'm sure you've heard a bit in the last couple of days about how PhD systems work. Um, I did graduate teaching. I tried to speak at conferences. I tried to get my research out there. I published. I did research fellowships in the US. Um, I also joined a variety of boards and research committees including the DECR board uh, during the PhD as well, to try to get experience project doing project management, organizing conferences, writing grant applications, but also to try and create spaces for PhDs and ECRs who are interested in art history um, in its broadest sense. And that's something uh, that I really enjoyed doing working with the DECR. I'm sure you've probably heard a bit about the pros and cons of doing a PhD and it can be wonderful, it can offer so many opportunities, but it's very solitary, it can be really really difficult at times, it's a lot of work and so it's really important to find a peer network and a good group of peers around you who can really help you through it. I think it's also really important to find a mentor and when you can pay that back and become a mentor for someone else. And that can be peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. 
or it can be mentoring through any kind of undergraduate or master's level teaching that you're doing. I think that's really important that, to see that generosity um, be transferred. I th think it's also really important, maybe at this point, to say that the real realities of going um, salaries for roles in both universities and museums and often to be aware that quite a lot of the time these are short term contracts for five months, six months, nine months. Um, so for me, the way that I've navigated that is from the start of my master's and then throughout the PhD and ever since actually literally until a couple of months ago, I've always done private tutoring outside of anything that I'm working on. Um, then that's been really to kind of financially fund myself. So I've done private tutoring for kind of 11 plus GCSE, A-level, undergrad, all subjects um, for several hours a week on top to just be able to survive financially. And I think it's really important to know that the art world is not always kind to those of us who don't have stacks of money or behind us or those of us who have caring responsibilities or regular financial requirements or are the main breadwinners. And especially if you want to live in one of the larger cities um, like London or Leeds or wherever it may be. So for example, last year I worked um, several teaching jobs at a range of universities, as well as working for a private art collector. And in the end, you know, it was a lot um, and they're short-term contracts and you're just trying to piece together a full salary. So it's really important to look after yourself if you can in those scenarios, but also having a group around you who can look after you too. Um, but also it's really important to join a union. So make sure you do that when and if, if and when you can. And I guess maybe the final key thing to note in terms of how I got to where I am today is networking. Um, I am much better at this now than I used to be. I used to, it sounded like I was going to cry when I would try and speak in public to people, which is not, not so good, but we've all been there. Um, and it's trying to put yourself out there by going to these events, asking questions, engaging with people. Um, and it can be really, really difficult. And you can, you know, it can be kind of um, not necessarily people don't necessarily always want to engage with you, but I think a lot of the time they do. And it can be really rewarding. And I would really advise you to attend societies that are dedicated to certain subjects that you're interested in. So like the AAH or museums and galleries groups or group societies that are dedicated to paintings or architecture, or decorative art, whatever it may be. Um, I'm aware there's an issue here in terms of where you live, um, but quite often these, are, these societies will have events around the country. Um, and quite often they will be really happy to see students and younger people there. They might have student discounts. Um, they most likely also have quite a lot of money for research projects. Um, or to fund you to attend a conference or to pay for your membership. I've had that happen before. And they tend to be much cheaper than associations like the Museum Association, which I've never actually been able to afford. I've never been a member of the Museum Association for that, you know, um, previously for that reason. Okay, so uh, what do I do now? Well, um, I still wear a variety of hats, as it were. Um, so since 2018, I've been lecturing on the History of Design Masters with the V&A and RCA. And I run modules on country houses, ceramics, material culture. And I also supervise master's students, dissertation students. And actually from September 2021, I will have my own PhD students, which is crazy, but there we go. Um, I'm a curator for 17th and 18th century ceramics and glass at the V&A. And also from time to time, I still work as an art consultant for private art collections and also as an external examiner for University of Sunderland. So what do I actually do? Um, I had to put a meme in. Uh, I sort of tailored this one, but I think it's a good place to start when thinking about maybe what I do as an art historian and a museum curator. Um, so I think the first up is kind of self-explanatory, what my parents think I do. Um, of course, it's a snapshot from the Da Vinci Code. Sadly, I'm not running around London or Paris or Rome in the middle of a great art heist a la Robert Langdon. Although sometimes I do get to play the detective working on provenance research. 
Um, or actually at the moment I'm working on a ceramic sculpture that was once caught up in a fix and forgeries debate. So sometimes there's a kind of sense of action. What my colleagues think I do, surrounded by books, um, I am a lot of the time and being a curator a lot of the time is about knowledge and expertise but um, it's also I think about building up knowledge that can be then disseminated as widely as possible but mostly I think I'm surrounded by spreadsheets uh, more so than anything else realistically. What society thinks I do I put this one in because I think there's still this idea that art historians and museum curators are, you know, sat stuff in stuffy old musty offices, writing and reading for themselves. But I think that has really, really changed. And there's much more today about encouraging public engagement. And the job is much more about facilitating knowledge and promoting access to the collections. Um, I, I do really believe that. What my friends think I do, of course, we're all fighting museum displays at night. Um, but I think I wanted to set this one in because I think sometimes there's this idea that if you work in the art world, you know, you're just going to glamorous party openings and things like that. And the reality is you're attending conferences, sipping terrible coffee and eating slightly warm sandwiches. Um, but once or twice, maybe you do get to go to these art fair events and, and have, um, have a bit more of a soiree, as it were. Uh, the second to last image, some of you may recognise it, it's a snap from Mona Lisa Smile. Uh, I love that movie. But for me, I absolutely love teaching. Teaching helps me rethink and refine my ideas and my arguments and what I want to do or think about things. Um, and it's so rewarding having students at a range of different stages. Um, so yeah, I'd love to think of myself as a glamorous Julia Roberts in the 1950s, but I'm not too sure. And then what do I actually do? Uh, well, this is a slide. Uh, this is a photograph from the 18th century section of the V&A of open storage display. Um, so these are my, some of the objects that I get to look after. So I started my job as the curator of 17th and 18th century ceramics and glass at the V&A in May 2020. Uh, so it's been a bit of an odd start to a new job um, in many, many ways. Uh, mostly because my whole team were furloughed, um, so I started with really no one else in the museum, uh, which has been an interesting kind of first six, nine months of a new position. So we have one of the largest collections of ceramics in the world, and I'm responsible for roughly about 20 to 25,000 objects. So, you know, easy. I'll know them all by the end of this year, year I'm sure. Um, it's a huge honour. It's a privilege to work here. Um, and I have worked and continued to work extremely hard to show that I'm the right person for this job, but it is really daunting. There's a lot to do. Just looking at that image hopefully gives you an idea of the amount of objects. Um, and there's quite a lot still that needs to be rethought or reframed um, about putting these objects within wider contexts. So like a sugar bowl or a teapot in a wider context of histories of empire, of slavery, of colonialism, of labor, of class, of consumption. Um, and, you know, questions of, am I the right person to be rethinking these things? So lots, I think a lot to learn still. I interviewed for this job about a year ago, and I did just want to talk very quickly through the interview process, because I think um, museum interview processes, if you get to that stage, are fantastic, but they can be really quite grueling. Uh, there are lots of questions about my knowledge, about my publications, my ambitions for the role, how I work with VIP patrons and funders, um, what type of research projects would I undertake. I also had to give a 10 minute presentation of a exhibition that I would put on and think about marketing and budget and strategies and texts and labels within that as well. Um, so they tend to quite, they want you to have a lot of information that not only speaks to the job description, but kind of shows your thinking beyond that. And also part of the interview process was an object test with three random objects. And that is something that they will tend to bring out even for slightly higher positions, actually, um, particularly for entry level assistant curator and curator roles as well. So something to bear in mind if you are thinking of going for museum positions. So here, um, just the last few minutes, I wanted to kind of give you a snapshot into my life or a day to day day of my life. Um, 
uh, hopefully the, this slide can maybe be shared um, afterwards because there's a lot kind of packed in here. Some of these I think are probably self-explanatory or you would maybe expect so like object research or caring or learning about your collection. Um, but also other things like bugs, exclamation point, uh, pest control is really key um, to making sure your objects are looked after. And being a curator is not all glamorous. Sometimes it is about rolling on the floor, trying to find the bug trap, um, which is covered in dust and bugs to change it, to make sure that your collections are looked after as best as possible um, and to monitor things like that. And you're also doing exciting things um, that have a lot of responsibility. So you're giving advice to government bodies and to the Arts, Arts Council about objects, about exporting objects, about um, uh, tax, various things like this as well um, as teaching, publications, giving lectures, doing tours, running opinion days for the public, um, but also spreadsheets. So, so many more spreadsheets than I ever realised I would be dealing with. Okay, so finally, just some kind of key takeaways. Um, this has been a kind of uh, sweeping um, journey and I hope it's brought some kind of um, sense of who I am and what I've been trying to do. But I know my story is very different to lots of other people's. But I think some of my key things are join networks, academic societies, object specific associations, and especially get active on social media, especially if you're like me and actually at times you're quite introverted or um, particularly several years ago I felt really shy about speaking out and asking a question and it's, you can do something on social media on Twitter you can connect with someone that way uh, it, it just makes it slightly easier when you eventually do meet them in person at a conference um, or go for coffee with them things like museum hour on Mondays can be great they help you put yourself out there and hear what other people are saying and what's kind of happening at this point as well so join in in discussions ask questions and don't be afraid to put yourself out there build your own contacts reach out to people you admire build a close-knit group of peers who will lift you up sometimes it's really difficult and um, you really need someone to help to really kind of talk to and, and listen who maybe understands um, so I think that's really key and I wouldn't have gotten where I've gotten to today without the generous generosity of people really um, helping me and keeping me sane especially uh, when that imposter syndrome comes knocking and it does sadly it still does um, and get your own mentor if you can, but I really think it's so important that if you get to a place where you can pay it back to others, um, to, and I really do try to pay that back to my students or colleagues that I'm working with. Find out what interests you the most and own it. I love ceramics, I'm potty about pots, that's okay. It's a good thing actually, um, and I'm, I'm kind of happy with that. Try lots of different things within and outside of academia and museums. I had no idea how much I would love teaching when I started to do it at the start of my PhD. But also I think it's important to know that just because you do a PhD, it doesn't mean you can only work in a university or that by working in a museum or arts, arts organization means that you cannot research, you cannot publish, you cannot teach. I think there has to be more of a fluidity between everything. Um, and again, back to the idea of collaboration. Say yes to all things within reason. Uh, you never know what opportunities will arise from something so small as emailing someone or being introduced to someone at a conference or event or being tasked to do something, do it well, work incredibly hard and get noticed and known for what you're doing. And that can lead on to another recommendation or a much bigger project. But, and my final point, it's a big but, learn that it's okay to say no. Um, to be honest, I think this is probably where I need to finish because um, I'm still fairly early in my career. I'm still trying to figure out my own work-life balance and I'm trying to learn that it's okay to say no as well. But I think perhaps more importantly, if I rephrase that, that I think it's okay and it's a good thing to prioritise what you say yes to. So I guess to end, I think it's incredibly important that we are the generation that changes things and makes things better, actually diversifies the art world and reframes the hierarchies and the patriarchies embedded within it, that we inspire each other, we lift each other up. And most of all, I think that we look after each other. 
and we look after ourselves. So good luck. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to answer any questions or talk to anyone else in more detail um, if you have anything else to ask. Fantastic. Thank you, Caroline, so much. Um, yeah, there were, I mean, a huge, huge amount to, to say from that. There's been a lot of um, questions um, in the chat, again, about networking, which I think you answered um, um, quite well. And, and I think a lot bottles down to what Amisha was saying, just about being brave and um, putting yourself out there at the moment, whether it's on emails, social media, attending online events and that type of thing. We had a question um, from Alyssa in the in the Q&A box. Oh, um, she says, I'm finding that post my MA, I'm lucky enough to take on lots of smaller things like small jobs, applications, projects, extra learning and lectures. But what is your advice for balancing everything? I'm finding that just always that I'm just always exhausted lately and struggling to keep up. And I think that's um, something we can all relate to. Yeah. Great question, Alyssa. Hi, so nice to see names you recognise. Um, yeah, I completely uh, understand that and I completely am the same. I am trying to be, still trying to navigate that, I think, in all honesty, and I'm trying to make sure I have a day off every week. Um, but it, I think there is a reality of um, that this is, that there seems to be a chunk of time where you're expected to do all of these things, but also burnout is real. The toll of that precarity is real. And I, I really meant it when I said getting that group together, whether it's a group of peers who support you and, and you can lean on to lift you up or who can say, actually just stop working. You know what, you need a couple of days off. Just tell the editor that the, this sub publication will be delayed or you know, make sure you have time, really push back. So I think it's important to get those people behind you. And also if you can get a mentor who, um, will really help you and push you through on things, but also will kind of tell you, you know, you need to step back or you really need to take some time. So I think honesty and, and having people around you who really understand it. And I think as well, it's the, maybe the last thing I said about prioritizing what comes first. Does this really need to get done right now? Okay, the lecture's next week and you're getting paid for that lecture. So maybe prioritize that and leave some other things for a couple of weeks. And yeah, but I don't, I'm really trying to learn that as well. So that's, yeah. that's my honesty, but yeah, I think I think it's yeah something that we're all um, yeah we we all struggle with. And Melissa said earlier about just remembering that the whole world isn't going to fall apart if if you don't get your um, don't get something in um, or quite on time, even if it's your own goal. And there was another question about having to have. Um, a postgraduate degree like a master's or a PhD. Um, Elsa, do you think that larger establishments like the VNA expect a master's or a PhD, or can you still apply for these jobs, say, with only a BA? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, uh, in all honesty, it's getting better, but I think for the, of the last while, it's been an expectation that you have to have a postgraduate degree to get these jobs. And I know a lot of organizations like Fair Museums and other people are really striving to show that that isn't necessarily the case. I think it's, um, if you're thinking about doing a master's or a PhD, it's what experiences can you get from that, that you um, want to get. If it's purely to get the qualification, that's not necessarily the experience that's going to get you that job in a museum or arts heritage organisation. Uh, so something I've always been aware of is with the academic um, pathways is also having trying as, as much as I can to get experience working um, to kind of get all of those skills together. I think there is also though the reality and at the moment especially with um, the pandemic and with a lot of the financial restraints that organizations are facing that there's a sense of oh well if you're dividing through a pile of applications if you have someone with a PhD they will go to the top I don't think that is always the case at all um, but I do think if you're wanting to really specialize in a subject and be able to publish and lecture and maybe uh, do that that a PhD can offer you lots of things but it does not mean you're going to walk into these jobs and get them. I actually think it's almost the opposite because you take three to four years out of being in the workplace, or a lot of people do. Hope hmm. that kind of answers answers the question. Yeah, that that's yeah, that's um, great. Thank you. Um, well, I think we'll we'll just wrap up. But do you do you have any um, 
kind of other tips for how you stay motivated um just to um <laughs> be here all night uh if we're in real normal place to go to, go to the pub and just you know have that awful warm cup of coffee anyway that you get at conferences um for me it's resolve it's the fact that people uh I speak with people and they go, oh, you're very young. Oh, have you really got a PhD? Oh, who are, you know, and there's these ideas that come from who you are or how you sound or how you look. And for me, it's the result of making, deter like, determined to change that. Um, and it's the little things like the woman coming up to me in the bathroom to hand me that list of how I pronounced all the names incorrectly. I think about that a lot, but actually, you know what? I think that in some ways drives me forward. Um, but it's also speaking with other people. I think it's being transparent. A lot of the time on places like Twitter, you're like, oh, I got this funding, I got this great thing. Um, I, all, I mean, I, maybe I should have done that, you know, stuff I went for and didn't get. The, um, the my lecturing role at the VNA, which I've had for the last few years and continue to have. When I went for that interview, I didn't get it. I was second choice. And a few months, well, maybe two months later, I had a phone call from the head of department of program saying, uh, that they actually needed some extra teaching and they had me on the books would I do it but I didn't actually get the job first time round. um so little things like that I think it's trying to persevere and not give up and you're not the only one in in that boat um so yeah uh I think if hopefully um that may be but it's really hard it's really hard and um it's just trying to keep going and having the right people around you to help you do that is really important yeah, which brings us back around to kind of working with other people and collaborating. So that's really nice. There's been some really great um, messages to you and comments in the chat, including some love for Ireland, for your meme um, and for your necklace as well. <laughs> I have all of these. <laughs> I was potty about pots, I'm not kidding. But um, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. It was, you know, I'm really happy to speak to more people in depth. And, um, you know, I think it was what Amisha was saying earlier, like be ballsy, like get a mentor, ask people. If you've heard people today and yesterday and you've really felt like you could connect with them, like reach out. We all know this is a really hard industry. So it's just working, um, yeah, trying to push past those initial barriers sometimes. Absolutely. And um, thank you so much, Caroline. I'm going to quickly pass over to Gersten Ran, who has um, just some closing remarks, and then we'll finish the day. Thank, thank you, Caroline. That was fantastic and so insightful and so truthful about some of the realities in our industry, but also the joys that are to be found in there. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to actually start by thanking everyone who's spoken over the last two days, including Caroline. They've given up their valuable time and they've been so honest and open about their journeys and experiences and there's been so much valuable advice. I hope you, our attendees, are coming away from this event with a better understanding about the career opportunities and prospects that are in our industry and I hope that you can also see the importance each speaker has placed on collegiality and self-care and self-preservation. Those are some really important aspects there. I'd like to remind everyone, although we've covered this quite a lot, but I'd like to remind everyone one simple takeaway, uh, but it's a really effective piece of advice. Don't be afraid to reach out, say hello and express your enthusiasm about art or a project with people already in the industry. The simple gesture can lead you to a job or an opportunity. You can find that most people who are interested in hearing from people already excited about something that they're passionate about. Um, there are challenges and there is precarity in art history, which can leave one feeling disheartened sometimes, but creating networks and support groups and trying new things can be a great way to develop your skill set and look after yourself and advance your career. And don't forget the DCR and the association are here to support you. With that in mind, I'd like to say a big thank you to our speakers and to our organisers of this DECR event, Sarah French and Caitlin Delvey. I know Caitlin had to run off to teach, but they put together work tirelessly on it. So thank you so much to you guys. I'd also like to thank Alicia Hughes for creating such fun and interesting content on our social media. And on behalf of the DCR, I'd like to express our gratitude to Claire Davies at the association who spoke yesterday and who has been supporting us throughout this last few days to facilitate this conference. If you'd like to share any feedback about your experiences at Careers Day on behalf of the DCR, we really appreciate your thoughts and ideas. 
So please take a few minutes to complete the questionnaire, which will be sent to you next week. Finally, I'd just like to remind you that applications are open to the DECR's bursaries to attend the annual conference and to the postgraduate dissertation prizes. If you're interested in finding out about these awards, then do take a look at the association website. And there's also plenty of information on the DECR Twitter page. Thanks again for joining us. We really loved having your company. Our next event is Professional Development Day for postgraduate and early career researchers and practitioners. And that's probably in May or June. So if you're interested in pursuing this career further and are considering about developing the skill set, then please keep an eye out for that. I look forward to seeing you all again soon and thank you so much for joining us. Bye bye.